Mike, good evening. Can you hear us? Good evening. Yes, I can. Uh, actually, yeah, the first question about this uh, American attack in Syria. There are many rumors about that. And, for example, Bloomberg uh, informs that there were more than 200 Russians killed in this attack. But actually, they have no evidence. Uh, can you please tell more what is actually, what do we know for, for sure now about the, this attack? Well, based on um, some of the more reliable uh, social media analysts who cover Russian war dead, be it in Ukraine or Syria, we've confirmed about eight, maybe nine uh, Russian mercenaries affiliated with the Wagner Group, which I'm sure Ukrainian viewers of your show are quite familiar with because they had been deployed to Donbass in the last few years. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, the Bloomberg report I'm a bit skeptical of only because the sourcing is one unnamed U.S. official and three, quote, Russians familiar with the matter. Now, we did a deep dive uh, at the Daily Beast about the kind of scuttlebutt that we were hearing of, of these inflated uh, or exaggerated claims of hundreds, possibly 600 Russian mercenaries killed in a U.S. airstrike. A lot of this emanates from the Russian ultra-nationalist uh, community including uh, and especially Colonel uh, Igor Strelkov, who I absolutely know Ukrainians are familiar with, as he was the commander of the DNR. He's a former Russian intelligence officer uh, and in the past has, has tried to embarrass Putin by suggesting that Russia didn't do enough to help Russian fighters in, in Ukraine. And, and my, my sus uh, suspicion or my theory as to why um, there's an exaggerated uh, casualty and fatality rate is these ultra-nationalists are trying to goad the Kremlin into responding militarily to the United States. In other words, coax Russia into war with America. I mean, just based on the history of U.S. engagement in Syria, there's never a, 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 a willingness or an enthusiasm to engage pro-regime forces. That when, Whenever these operations have been undertaken, they've been undertaken in self-defense because pro-regime forces have antagonized uh, American allies, particularly the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is a largely Kurdish uh, paramilitary operation, uh, and U.S. special operators in the field. I have never seen a single example where a U.S. airstrike, for instance, took out 600 ISIS fighters. So the idea they would have killed 600 Russians, to me, is, is completely ludicrous. Um, so the real question is, how many? And, uh, you know, will this happen again? And, and what I'm sort of, of of the mind to believe is that, look, uh, Putin is relying on mercenaries because they're plausibly deniable and they're expendable. Um, they're illegal under Russian law to use and to send into the field, but the Russian government does this because it would rather send in guns for hire than um, Russian regular army soldiers. So you notice the Kremlin's response to this was, we have no evidence, we, you know, Peskov said we need to uh, verify these claims, blah, blah, blah. In other words, Russia's pretending like it didn't happen so that it doesn't have to do anything about it. It doesn't have to retaliate. And that probably means they'll continue to use these kinds of elements, these, these uh, private military contractors, to kind of test the, the fortifications and the deterrent capability of the U.S. zone that is now emerging in one-third of Syria. But, yeah, I, I haven't seen any hard evidence to suggest these hundreds of, of people have been killed. The Pentagon's first initial reaction was to say that about 100 pro-regime forces were taken out. But pro-regime forces aren't just Russian mercenaries. They also include Syrian uh, operators in the field. And we have evidence to, to show that, indeed, Syrian fighters were killed in, in, in that airstrike. So I just take uh, some of these crazier claims with, with a great deal of, of caution and skepticism. because we, There's no hard proof of any of it yet. Can you please tell more how the American forces coordinate and cooperate with the Russians in Syria? Because more or less we can say that they are on the same side of the war. Yes and no. I mean, they don't cooperate. And they do coordinate uh, in, in, in what's known as a deconfliction kind of uh, protocol. In other words, they let the Russians know when they're coming near Russian uh, patrolled airspace or Russian ground space. And they say, basically, stay out of our way. Now, in this instance, there has been some reporting in the Washington Post by David Ignatius, who's in Syria now, or who was when he filed his piece, suggesting that the Syrian Democratic Forces, these, these Kurdish-American proxies, alerted the Russians to what they were doing uh, and were ignored by Russia. And the Americans also alerted the Russians to what was happening, similarly ignored. And instead, this pro-regime contingent, uh, which includes, as I say, the Wagner uh, group, 
uh, pressed ahead and, and, and started to attack uh, SDF positions. And, and these SDF positions include U.S. Special Forces embedded with the Kurds. So America had no choice but to retaliate in order to defend its, its guys on the ground. Um, but it, you know, to say that they're on the same side, look, it is true that America has prioritized in the last few years since it went to war with ISIS, uh, fighting only Sunni jihadists and making a point, bending over backwards to reassure the Assad regime, the Iranians and the Russians, we have no quarrel with you. Our mission is very uh, limited uh, as a counterterrorism one. But now things are changing. Um, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson has outlined the contours of a Syria policy, if not the, the actual meat of a Syria policy, and has made it clear, look, America is staying in Syria. It is going to occupy, lightly occupy, not like Iraq, but you know, with a few thousand troops uh, and relying heavily on the, the Syrian Democratic Forces as its ground army, about a third of Syrian territory east of the Euphrates uh, River which uh, is, is the borderland that Syria shares with, with Iraq. Now, the goal for this is to ensure that ISIS doesn't reconstitute itself as a caliphate and is kept down, but also, and I think even primarily, to keep the regime, the Iranians and the Russians out of that area, to deprive this axis of resistance plus Moscow from um, essentially taking over all of the Levant. Now, Iran wants to establish a land bridge between uh, Tehran and the Mediterranean coast, this will disrupt that ambition. So the American uh, objective in Syria is now shifting away from strict counterterrorism to, as the Pentagon outlined in its defense strategy, uh, great power conflict and, and, and geopolitical uh, struggle, containment uh, in, in a word, containment of America's regional and global adversaries in the region. So I, I, I say that there's a coming confrontation with Russia. I mean, what you're seeing now is essentially spheres of influence being carved out, and both sides will engage in these light and, and uh, easily de-escalated skirmishes. Now, the, the risk that this, this poses, of course, is that, well, what happens if these light and easily de-escalated de skirmishes turn into something bigger, a, 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 a more consistent confrontation, and something that cannot be so easily de-escalated. But look, I don't think that Washington and Moscow uh, are stupid or crazy enough to, to, to risk all out war between the United States and Russia. And again, this is why they're using mercenaries on the Russian side, because they can say, like they did in Ukraine, we're not even here. We, these aren't our guys. We don't employ them, even though Wagner and, and other groups are indeed under the command of the Russian Defense Ministry and are paid by the Russian government and are now, according to reporting done in the Russian press, being offered a stake in Syria's oil and gas sector uh, as a reward for their adventurism abroad. Uh, at least we know about eight or nine of these Wagner fighters in Syria. Yeah. And still yeah. it's like, you know, it's the first time when Russians are killed by Americans in Syria. Uh, what is important, like you said about these consequences, possible consequences, uh, which, uh, what can be answer of Moscow, of Kremlin in Syria? Is it like really serious situation? Well, I mean, they have two choices, and it's clear which one they've opted for. Choice number one, America has, has killed Russian contract soldiers in Syria. Uh, doing that, though, would put a lot of pressure on Putin to respond or retaliate in some fashion, whether rhetorically or militarily. Doesn't want to do that. That's option two. Option two is we have no evidence that any of our people have been killed by the Americans, um, but, you know, they'll carry on with a disinformation propaganda campaign. America is there to steal Syrian Arab land and America is supporting ISIS and blah, blah, blah. So more of the same. But again, it, it, it shows that, you know, Putin cannot go too far in antagonizing the United States because he knows he's up against a superior adversary. He knows that, I mean, look, America will defend itself if, if Russian regular soldiers or if Russian Air Force uh, try to attack U.S. military positions in Syria, they would be shot back at. They would be counterattacked. Uh, and that could not be done in a plausibly deniable fashion. So again, I, I, I see here some gray zone, some ambiguity in what Russia is trying to do. And again, why does Russia want this area that America is still uh, going to be indefinitely occupying? The answer to that is Syria's economy is rebounding after several years of attritional warfare, but 
Putin does not want to be a permanent patron of Bashar al-Assad. He doesn't want to have to continue to give Syria loans that don't get repaid or send free shipments of oil and so on. He wants Syria to be self-sustaining, and he wants the Syrian reconstruction economy to be very much like the Russian uh, economy, floated on corruption and racketeering and sort of mafia tactics. Now, in order to do that, you need to take back the energy uh, industry. You need to take back oil and gas fields, and the most significant uh, oil fields in Syria or in Hasaka province in the northeast, which is part of this this new American protectorate. So, you know, here again, America is actually undercutting Russian and behind them Iranian and Syrian ambitions for essentially recapturing the entire country. That's that's now been foreclosed as a, as a possibility. Assad will never rule all of Syria so long as American troops are in 30 percent or 33 percent of the country. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your answers. It was really interesting.